Almost 20 years ago, we broadcast one of the most controversial stories in our 44 years on the air. It was called, Yes, But Is It Art? I was accused of being a Philistine, someone lacking the aesthetic sensibility to appreciate the challenging nature of some contemporary art. Art like Jeff Koons' floating basketballs, or another artist's dripping faucet. In those 20 years, works that I questioned, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, are now worth hundreds of millions. In fact, contemporary art has become a global commodity, just like oil or soybeans or pork bellies. And there seems to be no shortage of people wanting to speculate in it and no shortage of billionaires willing to invest in it as a haven for their cash or love of art or as a status symbol. And to feed those beasts, there are now art fairs virtually every weekend around the globe. And in contemporary art, none are more important than the one we went to in December. The story will continue in a moment. Hey. To Miami Beach, once a mere escape from the winter blues. Now one of the great contemporary art capitals of the world. The region hosts at least 30 art fairs annually, the most important of which is Art Basel. In Miami, the executive jets arrive by the swarm, more even than flit in for the Super Bowl. 50,000 people turn up, dressed up and dressed down. You can't tell the billionaires from the wannabes. The gawkers from the gawk dad, the exhibitionists from the exhibitions. They come to celebrate the bonanza that contemporary art has become. The art market sizzles while the stock market fizzles. This is where big disposable income comes to be disposed. I'm going to invite us to head inside just to say hello. Inside, you'll find an upscale flea market a shopping mall where prices start at the thousands and end in the stratosphere. There's very little sense of an aesthetic experience here, not the silence or even the suppressed hush of a gallery or museum. What you hear or imagine you hear is the cacophony of cash. This is $750,000. This fair seems to be about art as stuff or stuff as art. Just so much merchandise without a price tag in sight. There are some timeless gems maintaining a quiet elegance, but they're shouted off the walls by the kitsch, the cute, the clumsy, and the incomprehensible. From oversized headwear to art as performance, and of course, video art, an artist in the agonizing throes of creation. And then there's the question you've been dying to ask. How much is this stuff worth? Rather, how much does it cost? There's a price for you, and there's a price for me, and there's a price for somebody else. Yeah. I, Dennis Scholl and his wife Deborah are longtime collectors, familiar with the unwritten rules of the art bazaar. It's really what a willing buyer will pay to a willing seller in the art world. So when you go and look at a piece of art, you know, the price is, is what you negotiate. There's no fixed price per se. And prices move up and prices move down very quickly in the art world, particularly with young artists. And have you made some mistakes or have they all been pretty... <laughs> well, we've bought a thousand pieces of art in my life, so we've made plenty, plenty of mistakes. I mean, we have, yes. There are, and you know what you do? You just bury them in the backyard and forget about them. <laughs> so. 265 dealers are invited and they're willing to spend up to $150,000 for the privilege of showing their wares. Am I, are we such Philistine slobs that we wonder about the value of some of this? Is this art that dazzles the eye or makes us think? Do baby blue translucent bathroom fixtures prick the imagination? Does that toilet seat raise our spirits or is it directing us to the men's room? Or is this the biggest scam since Hans Christian Andersen trotted out the emperor's new clothes? One thing's for sure, it's no joke. Look at this graph. Contemporary art sales last year totaled about $5.5 billion, and that only includes auction prices, 
Private sales like these art fairs could be worth billions more. Recession? What recession? Good. Steel. Steel. Perfect. Cool. Great. I'll bill you. The real fundamental thing is we're here to sell a lot of art. Tim Blum, a partner in Blum and Poe, a Los Angeles gallery renowned for discovering the sharpest of cutting-edge art. Some of the art that you sell probably could be described as difficult. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I mean, we kind of specialize in that. You have to explain to a potential buyer yes. why he or she might yeah, often, learn to love this. Often you do. A lot of folks are just buying. It's more like we need one of these things because everybody's getting one. Status. And it's a status symbol. It's a speculative up, uh, mechanism. Do you sometimes have to grit your teeth even when you're making a sale? Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're very good at that. We're from Hollywood. We're, we're, <laughs> we're in the acting game. Yeah, it's theater. This is all theater. And Blum knows all the A-list collectors. There's people that are collecting art in a very beautiful, organic, autobiographical way where, where the art is a part of their lifeline. And then there's the pure speculators, and then there's the people that just have so much money, and the art is the next, is the next thing on the queue. You're appealing to the 1% as opposed to the 99%, correct? 1% and or 0.0001%. We just bought Oh, you did. Oh, you did. Oh, you did. Oh, you did. Eli Brode, the 1%er of 1%ers, one the collector of thousands of artworks, builder of his own museum. He's giddy with the thrill of having beaten the pack to a drawing by Kara Walker, a truly gifted young American artist. Collectors like Mr. Brode get first dibs on the really good stuff. He moved on to pick up photographs by Cindy Sherman. He was one of her first collectors. Love Cindy and love her work. He has good reason to love Cindy. He first bought her pictures back in 1982 for $250. Today they go for nearly $4 million. All of her subject matter is herself in various guises. Her current retrospective at New York's Museum of Modern Art gives her work even more value. What are you looking for? For dealers, the gold standard is selling to a major museum. So when Jennifer Stockman on the right, president of the board of the Guggenheim Foundation, along with a senior curator, Alexandra Monroe, turns up, the waters part. If you go into this conference, let's walk in. They, along with the dealer Barbara Gladstone, went ape over this sculpture by Anish Kapoor. And then you also don't know, and you have no idea of depth. I mean, it's very strange. He comes right out of We moved on to an installation by Hege Yang, a Korean artist. This tangle of extension cords, asking price, $33,000. We already are very committed to this artist, so I'm really excited to come and see new work by Hege. She is a perfect example of a contemporary, peripatetic, global artist. I always find some sadness in your work. Some, something's unstable, something's unfinished, something's like never complete. It's always in the process. And, and I think that's sort of how we, we live today. Art speak, the descriptive language of contemporary art, can seem as opaque as spilled alphabet soup. And the art fair gives you a very good context for this. Because but a language fully understood by Jeffrey Deitch, former dealer, now director of the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. He could not resist reminding us of our report of 1993 and who had the last laugh. In the art world, we remember very well that famous program that you did 20 years ago where you, it was almost a send-up of the contemporary art market. We and, had a little bit of fun with it. Yeah, that. sure, okay. but I think in terms of market value, the time that we were talking, a Jeff Koons was very well sold at $250,000. And as you know now, Jeff Koons works have gone for $25 million and more. And nearby, arguably the most powerful dealer in the art world, the famously reticent Larry Gagosian, owner of 11 galleries around the world. He reluctantly graced us with a few words of wisdom. At least say hello. Hey, Marlene. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? 
you always exclude Africa. I love it. <laughs> this place has become one of the one of the places that someone like yourself have to show at. Yeah, for me, it's a place to, to sell art. I mean, it's a place to make money. You know, the art fair has become a huge part of our business. How has China and Russia changed the art market? Yeah, it's been a huge, huge factor. I mean, the wealth in Russia, in the Middle East, in Asia, it's changed it, changed it dramatically. Just how dramatically can be seen in this graph. In orange is the contemporary art market's performance compared to the gray, which is the S&P stock index. Much of that dramatic rise is a result of those new billionaires from China and Russia parking their money in art. You have to tell me a little more about this, Victor. Maria Babakova, age 26, is interested in this dealer's Gerhard Richter, a German artist who is the current rage. He's got a lot of wall power. She's a Russian oligarch's daughter who's spending a fortune on contemporary art. And my painting, I'm selling it for $4.8 million, so you're getting a bargain with me today. That's a real bargain. I think so. Certainly a bargain if your daddy's a billionaire and you're playing in a market where the rule is, there are no rules. It's the Wild West. This is not a normal retail business. It's an unregulated, utterly bizarre place to uh, conduct business. The competition is great, yes? Yeah. It's literally a multi-billion dollar economy, the art world. So uh, the way the business is run and the competition between dealers, between artists, is often vicious. This is where the art trade's carefully constructed mask of Olympian high culture begins to crack. And the underside of a booming cutthroat commodities market is revealed. One without regulation or oversight in which price fixing and control of supply to maintain demand is both legal and commonplace. How does this boom keep sustaining itself uh, against all odds? It's inexplicable. I mean, it really is almost unexplainable and we don't even, when we bring it up and, wanna, and, start, and begin to talk about it, we sort of drop the subject because it, it almost feels like you should just let it, let it keep rolling. Because it's going against what's happening yeah, elsewhere in the economy. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Meanwhile, the prices rise and the band plays on, and all's well in this wonderful world. If the music stops and the bubble bursts, no big deal. The collectors are bubble-proof. It's only their mad money they're spending anyway. They'll still have the pleasure of their art, easier to look at than pork bellies. Or maybe not.